Okay, we've still got some more people joining us, but we can go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, our webinar is called An Equitable Carbon Plan for North Carolina, and it's uh, being hosted by NC Warren and the Charlotte Mecklenburg chapter of the NAACP, uh, because the two of us intervened together in the carbon plan docket at the Utilities Commission. Um, so uh, I'm Sally Robertson. I'm policy coordinator at NC Warren. You're also going to be hearing from Tina Katsanos. She's the climate justice and green workforce development chair at the Charlotte Mecklenburg NAACP. And then you're going to hear from Bill Powers, who is a San Diego environmental engineer who's been consulting with NC Warren for eight years or so and is also author of our Clean Path 2025 report that many of you know about. Um, please, you've been muted, so please keep yourself on mute and then we'll have questions at the end. If you have questions that you think of during the webinar, please put them in the chat and we'll ask as many as we can at the end. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so um, if you miss something or you want to see the slides again, you'll have that opportunity. We'll send the link out to everybody afterwards. So probably most of you know this already, but I was going to give a quick uh, overview of what is the carbon plan. Um, in 2019, the state adopted a clean energy plan that had the targets that ended up in the, car in the carbon plan. Um, so last year, HB 951 passed and called for a carbon plan by the end of this year that would achieve in the electric power sector 70% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, the uh, North Carolina Utilities Commission is the one that has to write that plan, but it started out that process by asking Duke to submit uh, Duke's draft proposal for a carbon plan. Duke Energy did that in May 2022. They filed their plan. Um, it is, as you might expect, not the greatest plan, has a lot of new frac gas infrastructure in it and other things that we don't like. But in July, um, we, our two organizations, along with a bunch of other parties, submitted comments about Duke's plan, and in some cases, alternative plans. And for the large majority of those parties disagreed with the way Duke was approaching uh, carbon reduction. So hope, we're hoping that the commission will see it our way. Uh, we're, you're going to hear a little bit tonight about uh, what we proposed. By um, the end of the year, the commission has to come up with its with the final plan, uh, which is final only in one sense, because it uh, is going to be reviewed every two years. So we'll have a chance at it again, but we're hoping that they will get off on the right foot and uh, adopt a plan that is actually clean. So what, what we said in uh, the carbon plan docket really goes back to what we've been working with, uh, working on with Bill since um, at least 2017, when he wrote the clean North, Carolina, North Carolina Clean Path 2025 report for us, which showed how we could get North Carolina electricity uh, fossil fuels for electricity down 57% by 2025 and 100% by 2030. So we were going to be off of fossil fuels in the electricity sector by 2030. Well, we've lost a few years since then, not using Bill's proposal. So um, uh, we might be a little behind schedule, but we're still hoping to convince people this is the way to go. Um, instead of what Duke is doing now in Bill's vision, there will be a lot of local solar near where the power is used, battery storage, and a lot more energy saving programs than we have now. It's cheaper than Duke's plan. It's, it creates more jobs and it provides a system wide approach. So now at the moment, I can benefit from solar because I put it on my roof, but we want a system wide approach where everybody can benefit from clean energy because that's what Duke is installing. So I just wanted to say a little bit about how just remind folks how 
Duke makes its money. It's operating expenses. Everything it spends on operating expenses are just passed through. If they spend a dollar on coal, we pay them a dollar. Um, if they spend a dollar for having an attorney be at the Utilities Commission for five seconds, we pay them a dollar. Um, and the cost is spread out all of, over all of Duke customers. But where it really makes its money is on the capital assets it builds. It gets an extra, it gets all its costs recovered plus 10% uh, profit on its capital assets. So of course Duke is incentivized to build the most expensive capital assets, the most capital assets and the most expensive capital assets that it possibly can. And at the moment it's, um, uh, prescription for success for its shareholders is build gas, um, keep running your nukes, uh, build, build solar, but build it as expensively as you can. And you're going to hear a lot about this later, build a lot of transmission lines because that's a real moneymaker for, for Duke. But it doesn't have to be this way. And Bill's going to tell us more about that later. Duke could be building uh, smaller scale smaller scale commercial solar and residential solar and putting batteries on our houses and um, doing all of this in a way that doesn't require all that transmission build out. Um, and we would be actually paying for what we want to see. So I'm going to turn it over now to Tina. As I told you, she's uh, Climate Justice and Green Workforce Development Chair for the Charlotte Mecklenburg NAACP. It's been really great working with her both on this and on the net metering docket. And she's going to uh, tell you about the part of the of our comments uh, that dealt with environmental justice concerns. So take it away, Tina. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, good evening and thank you for having me on. Um, I'd like to start with a very brief history of the NAACP's inception in order to highlight the cooperative efforts between Black and white people to fight back against systemic racism and to institutionalize this fight for civil rights. Uh, next slide. On February 12th, 1909, the nation's largest and most widely recognized civil rights organization was born. In 1908, a deadly race riot rocked the city of Springfield. Eruptions of anti-Black violence, particularly lynching, were horrifically commonplace. But the Springfield riot was the final tipping point that led the to the creation of the NAACP. Appalled at this rampant violence, a group of white liberals issued a call for a meeting to discuss racial justice. Some 60 people, seven of whom were African-American, signed the call, which was released on the centennial of Lincoln's birth. This is important because the NAACP needs white allies and white support. People of color cannot end racism. The people who can are those that perpetuate racism. Um, a lot of people don't know that the NAACP is open to people of all races and ethnicities, and we welcome everybody in our fight for justice. Since 1909, the NAACP is the boldest, the oldest, and the baddest civil rights organization in the US. Next slide. Our vision and mission as stated on our, uh, on our national NAACP website is the following. Our vision, we envision an inclusive community rooted in liberation where all per persons can exercise their civil and human rights without discrimination. Our mission is to achieve equity, political rights, and social inclusion by advancing policies and practices that expand human and civil rights, eliminate discrimination, and accelerate the well being, education, and economic security of Black people and all persons of color. The Charlotte Mecklenburg branch decided to legally intervene with regard to Duke Energy's carbon plan because one, we had the support of NC Warren and access to their legal resources. So thank you so much NC Warren for that. And two, because climate and environmental justice is a civil rights issue. Next slide. 
This is how the NAACP defines and describes environmental and climate justice as a civil rights issue. Environmental and climate justice is a civil rights issue. We depend on the physical en environment and its bounty. Toxic facilities like coal-fired power plants, which uh, the carbon plan um, plans to keep open, and incinerators emit mercury, arsenic, lead, and other contaminants into the water, food, and lungs of communities. Many of these same facilities also emit carbon dioxide and methane, the number one and number two drivers of climate change. But not all people are equally impacted. Race, even more than class, is the number one indicator for the placement of toxic facilities in this country hit by climate change. We support a transition away from fossil fuels that's comprehensive, systemic, and rooted in upholding our inalienable rights to air, water, food, housing, energy, and our livelihoods. Climate change is a threat multiplier. It exacerbates pre-existing problems for everyone, but especially for BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Duke Energy's carbon plan fails to mitigate climate change in an equitable and timely manner. It fails to heed the UN Secretary General's warning that we are currently in a code red for humanity moment. Duke Energy's carbon plan includes expansion of fracked methane gas use and infrastructure, continued coal use, and proposed new nuclear facilities which are based on unproven planning. These in, these included energy sources have already disproportionately impacted BIPOC community in terms of social and health burdens, and the carbon plan will continue the inequitable trend. The next slides will focus on the social health costs, which we elaborated upon in our intervention. The social health costs of methane gas facilities, this is a highlight of some of the things that we uh, mentioned in our intervention. Natural gas gathering and transmission pipelines in the US tend to be concentrated in counties with high social vulnerability. Negative impacts associated with pipelines fall disproportionately on communities with limited capacity to deal with the impacts. Decision makers who plan and permit pipelines should consider whether new projects maintain the inequitable status quo. Duke Energy's carbon plan does none of that. Next slide. Duke Energy's carbon plan does not support environmental and climate justice with continued coal use. The image that you see here is the Cliffside Steam Station Unit 6. It was the uh, last coal plant that Duke Energy uh, built um, in 2012, um, and it will be the last to be retired. This is really important to keep in mind because when Duke Energy proposes new um, uh, fracked methane gas infrastructure, you can bet that it's going to be uh, kept into use until it is no longer able to be used. This is not in line with the time frame that we have to get things under control. Next slide. The social health costs of continued coal burning include um, minority low income and indigenous populations frequently bear a disproportionate burden of environmental harms and adverse health outcomes, including the development of heart or, and or lung diseases such as asthma and bronchitis, increased susceptibility to respiratory and cardiac symptoms, greater numbers of emergency room visits and hospital admissions and premature deaths. Coal power plant emissions impact the health of nearby communities. They can also be transported across state and national boundaries to affect distant communities. Coal combustion is a major contributor to the criteria pollutants, particulate matter, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone, carbon dioxide, and airborne heavy metals such as mercury. These pollutants are linked to respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diminished cognitive functioning, and adverse birth outcomes. Next slide, please. Duke Energy's carbon plan does not support em environmental and climate justice with new nuclear. This image is actually a power plant in South Carolina that went, um, that went south. It's the summer power plant. And even though Duke Energy did not uh, 
start building this. Uh, instead, it was the South Carolina Electric and Gas Company. What Duke Energy has been proposing to do is continue building nuclear uh, sites. In fact, Duke Energy tried at three different sites based on the same model of the summer power plant, um, and, and it, it didn't happen. Um, so it wasted these uh, three different projects that were stopped, went bankrupt, wasted billions of dollars of ratepayer money. Next slide. Some of the social health costs of nuclear energy uh, include where evidence suggests that individuals living near within a 50 mile radius. And I want you to think about how much 50 miles is. 50 miles is, is it's like, you know, me going to another town. Um, so yeah, individuals living within a 50 mile radius, nuclear power plants face difficult to avoid health risks associated with exposure to low level routine radioactive effluents emitted from plants. Given that no level, that's really important. No level of radiation exposure is considered safe. Any excess exposure could have deleterious impacts on human health. The effects of radiation at the cellular level could lead to irreversible damage and potential premature death. Tritium to uh, highlight a common isotope is a carcinogen, mutagen, and sorry. <laughs> teratogen and can easily be incorporated into human tissues causing cancers, chromos chromosomal aberrations, birth defects and miscarriages and mental retardation after in utero exposure. In addition, research has cited the inequitable practice of toxic waste sites situated in BIPOC communities. Uh, next slide. We uh, also brought up some additional considerations uh, in our carbon intervention. Um, one includes that Duke solar plans would require large transmission lines, which would likely uh, go through low income communities causing disruption. Uh, in addition, the carbon plan did not meaningfully engage diverse community voices as it only had three stakeholder sessions and all of those stakeholder sessions were during the workday. The carbon plan lacks energy efficiency measures, which could lower costs for energy uh, burdened customers, in addition to lowering energy usage for the entire grid. It also lacks measures to make solar accessible to low income customers and communities, um, such as subsidized rooftop solar and or community solar. If we're gonna talk about energy justice, we have to talk about an energy democracy and that is clearly lacking from the plan. Uh, lastly, the one of the reasons, well, one of the ways that we built our case was by citing North Carolina Executive Order 246. So this is just a portion of that executive order that we highlighted in our carbon intervention. Climate change disproportionately impacts people of color, low income communities and indigenous communities and responsible solutions to climate change must equitably reduce GHG emissions, increase community resilience, advance sustainable economic recovery and infrastructure investment efforts, promote public health and health equity and ensure fair treatment and meaningful engagement in decision-making and implementation. And again, Duke Energy's carbon plan, uh, the community stakeholder uh, sessions that they held did not uh, hold true to North Carolina Executive Order 246. We've already seen what the health costs are, those external costs that weren't factored into Duke Energy's carbon plan. Uh, Duke Energy is not abiding by North Carolina Executive Order 246. Um, and again, those were some of the reasons why we decided uh, to intervene with Duke Energy's carbon plan. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, we're going to move on to Bill and then I, uh, remember folks to um, put your questions in the chat for me or Tina or Bill and then we'll get to them um, at the end. Um, I have to uh, switch to Bill's slides here. 
meanwhile, I will tell you that Bill is an environmental engineer in San Diego who is very kick ass and um, has been working oh. with us on multiple projects uh, for about eight years now. And we're very, it's very entertaining and also uh, rewarding. And um, I learn a lot from, oops, sorry. Wrong PowerPoint. I learn a lot every time I hear Bill talk. So I look forward to learning some more right now. All right. Thank you, Sally. Take it away. Okay. Oh, oh, hold on. I did not share. Sorry. Not a tech genius. I'm going to use my 20 minutes of fame to talk about the two different visions of decarbonization, really a top down Duke Energy carbon plan and a ground up NC Warren Clean Path 2025 distributed clean energy plan. And we can go to the next slide, Sally. So I, I would call the, the Duke Energy Carbon Plan the shareholder dream carbon plan. Uh, it will, as Sally pointed out, how a utility makes uh, an investor-owned private monopoly makes money. It's a guaranteed profit on infrastructure that they own. And this plan includes uh, tens of billions of, of new transmission lines, primarily to get to remote parts of rural North Carolina to move solar power from large-scale remote uh, solar farms. Includes adding thousands of megawatts of gas turbines, natural gas-fired gas turbines that um, Duke is indicating may someday burn green hydrogen, which is highly unlikely, and also thousands of megawatts of experimental small nuclear power plants, which is definitely the wrong road. And uh, the right road is doing this in a, a distributed fashion with many solar and battery storage facilities on homes, businesses, rooftops, parking lots, infill near, near uh, North Carolina cities and towns. And that really is the distributed generation counter proposal that uh, we presented to the commission. And so we'll talk about both of those uh, as we go through. But first, given that the distributed generation proposal is really based on the earlier plan I worked on for NC Warren, which is the NC Clean Path 2025, Sally mentioned it. We'll take a look at the next slide at, at some of the main features of this. Uh, the overarching feature really is a ground up uh, customer by customer approach where the homes and uh, businesses are uh, rapidly expansion, a rapid expansion of solar and, and storage on those what we would call point of use uh, locations. And these uh, additional bullets talk about in the NC Clean Path plan targeting 25% of homes and commercial buildings with solar by 2025, 50% by 2030. The objective was, to, was and is to displace existing coal and natural gas fired power and uh, to ultimately eliminate use of coal and gas by 2030. And there was another element to this too, in terms of equity, which is a part of you know, our joint presentation today is that there have been, there's pushback on customer owned solar as being uh, more of a, a rich white um, activity, having the ability to do this. And you know, initially when this was started, uh, especially in states that are much out in front of North Carolina, that, that, that wasn't completely wrong. More well-to-do homeowners were the initial adopters of this, but there are simple uh, equity tools to make sure that renters, people with poor credit, uh, uh, have just as much access to this as uh, those original adopters. And so the intent would be that all customers, regardless of, of race, class, economic standing, have equal access to this opportunity. Next. North Carolina has a lot of solar, but it's almost all uh, so-called utility scale. Uh, multiple acres generally in, in rural or uh, semi-rural areas. That uh, North Carolina, Duke's customers 
have less than 200 megawatts of rooftop solar as of now, uh, but the that isn't necessarily typical. In fact, it's atypical. I'm in California. We have a lot of utility scale, but we have a lot of rooftop. We've got over 13,000 megawatts of rooftop, and we are going to be adding about 2,000 megawatts of rooftop this year, uh, despite tremendous pressure from our uh, private monopoly utilities to try and slow this uh, excellent seamless program down. And the reason I bring this up, I uh, mentioned California, is that it may seem like a bit of a pipe dream in North Carolina, but uh, there are other states that are going gangbusters on, on rooftop. And um, one important point to make here, this market in California is somewhat larger than Duke's market in North Carolina, but not that much. We're going to add about 2,000 megawatts of, of rooftop house by house, commercial building by commercial building this year. And, and we've been doing this year after year now for a while. 2000 megawatts is two and a half times the cap that Duke Energy has put on its carbon plant expansion of solar. And I'm, I'm teeing that issue up now is that Duke is saying, hey, we've got to limit solar expansion to 750 megawatts a year because we just don't have the capacity until we spend billions on new transmission lines. There are other states that are putting far more solar than that on rooftops and buildings and parking lots now with no transmission upgrades. Next. So looking a little more deeply into Duke's carbon plan, again, in maximizing shareholder value uh, is a prominent feature, priority feature, transmission upgrades as much as 20 billion. At this point, it's a conceptual plan. It could be substantially more than that thousands of megawatts of new gas-fired plants sold on the promise that they would be transitioned into green hydrogen at some point in the future. Green hydrogen is a fantastically expensive uh, fuel. And uh, if it's green, that means it's gonna be produced from solar power or wind power. And the amount of solar or wind that would be needed to do that is uh, incredible in terms of square miles of space that would be needed to produce that power. Thousands of megawatts of, of uh, conceptual R&D, experimental, small modular nuclear units. You know, despite the nations and the world's history with uh, nuclear accidents, nuclear waste, uh, it, it's uh, very surprising to see this, this attempt at a renaissance of nuclear power, but it's there, and especially after 2035 in the carbon plan. And then, as I mentioned, uh, throttling down uh, North Carolina's solar expansion uh, to 750 megawatts. North Carolina put in 1,200 megawatts in 2017. So this is uh, approaching half what North Carolina has already demonstrated they can do uh, under the excuse that there isn't transmission capacity to move the solar. Next. And so this is a graphic kind of how it might look with the a distributed generation uh, decarbonization NC Clean Path 2025 approach. Up on the top of this graphic, you see the control center, which is uh, connected to three uh, gray boxes of the distribution substations. And those really take high voltage power off the grid traditionally and then put it at a lower voltage, send it to homes and businesses. But in this graphic, you see a little blue squares interspersed. Those are solar panels on carports, parking lots, rooftops. And they're right in the city, they're right near the city. And other uh, tools being used to reduce loads so that much of the power is actually generated um, close to where it's used. And not only does that mean no new transmission is needed, it unloads the existing transmission and distribution system. It also eliminates any kind of restriction on solar additions, as I pointed out in California. No issues, adding a tremendous amount of, of solar power into neighborhoods and urban areas. Why? Because power that used to be sent over the grid is now being generated right there and you don't need to send uh, power, you're unloading the grid. So it it's, uh, re removes that restriction. And, and just to underscore again, when we talk about system-wide benefits is the, the, the need to avoid adding billions of dollars transmission, if it is credited to putting in this distributed solar, 
makes distributed solar a better economic proposition for the individual customer and the state. One of the challenges in these proceedings, North Carolina Utilities Commission, and other parts of the country is they don't credit the money that you didn't spend because you went this, down this road. And until that happens, you get a skewed calculation of the economic benefits of this uh, better economic proposition than the business as usual utility proposal. Next. So this is just a pictorial graphic of, okay, so you saturate a neighborhood with solar and everyone has batteries. Green Mountain Power, Vermont, first phase of this project, 2000 homes. They aggregate the batteries from these homes, they dispatch to the grid, they save everyone money. Next slide. Recent example, uh, July of 2022, Green Mountain Power, they like the program, customers like the program, they double it. Now it's 4,000 homes with batteries. They dispatch these batteries as a unit to the grid. In one afternoon, they save $1.2 million for their customers, but they save that for all their customers. All 270,000 customers got the benefit of the savings, even though only 4,000 customers actually had the batteries that enabled uh, the peak shaving and the benefit. And so I wanna read, take one minute to read these two bullets because this is really the ball game from the article. Many utilities worry about losing control and potentially revenue in a world of consumer owned energy devices. Green Mountain Power embodies a different vision, creative utility, managing this local energy to benefit everyone. Next bullet. The fact that this model exists implicitly challenges other utilities to do more with readily available consumer energy technology. This is exactly right. This is one utility getting the job done with this new tool, uh, admonishing really utilities like Duke for having their head in the sand. Next. So in this proposal, distributed generation counter proposal, one of the elements is of uh, putting solar on uh, big box stores and covering their parking lots with solar and doing this hundreds of times, thousands of times, so that the bulk of the solar power is being generated in arrays of this type. Next. Uh, warehouses, big facilities. You can look at the vehicles the, the, and you can see these are semi trucks parked along this, these warehouses. Each warehouse is generating one to two megawatts group them together and you have a 100 megawatt project. Next. Uh, a lot of color in this slide, but the point of this slide is just to look at the economies of scale of solar because many people would dismiss rooftops of any kind as just being much more costly than doing big projects in rural areas. But what this is looking at is, if you look at the two bars on the left, down below it says commercial rooftop, 200 kilowatts. Uh, it could be an uh, office depot, not a very big commercial rooftop. And then to the right, a utility scale project, 100 megawatts, 500 times bigger. Well, let's look at 2021. That's the second bar in from the left, 2021 rooftop. And then second bar on the smaller, the utility scale. Look at those bars. First one is first three are hardware, module, inverter, uh, other hardware. They're pretty much the same in terms of cost between the big project and the small project. Orange, other costs, soft costs, hustling the work of finding the rooftops. That's the significant difference is lining up the rooftops. The actual economies of scale of solar are reached very quickly. Next. So has this been done? Have, have, has anyone gone out and lined up many, many rooftops bundled into one big project, and then basically done it as an alternative to utility scale remote? And the answer is yes, it happened in this state. Our governor Schwarzenegger, the Terminator, uh, fresh face said, hey, I'm flying over all these warehouses, I wanna see solar, does it? And instructed the utilities and the commission to get it done. And they did, we said that this, doing it this way saves uh, cost of building transmission, next. Our Utilities Commission authorized a 500 megawatt project, which is huge. That was the biggest solar project in America at the time. And the reason they did it is said we can, we can build fast and we can do it without building expensive new transmission lines is underlined here. Next. 
And the project took off. Uh, 100 megawatts got built, but the governor left. And in this case, the governor was the key. The utilities were doing something they would prefer not to do because this doesn't require transmission. He left, a new, more conventional governor came in, and the utilities were successful in transitioning the rest of the capacity to traditional remote transmission dependent capacity. But it, it's a great model for moving forward in North Carolina. Next. And just to give you a sense of, so you, you're talking about one megawatt, three megawatts, uh, 100 megawatts. Here's an example of what I would call a human sized ground mounted project, 2.7 megawatts. You can see some buildings in the upper left, gives you an idea of you know, what's two or three megawatts look like. Next. And also, does North Carolina have a capacity to do this? And part of Clean Path 2025 was research by me into what North Carolina's potential is. And I found that North Carolina has over three times the potential needed to decarbonize on rooftops, parking lots, infill, ground mounts. Where did this information come from? It came from the US EPA, and it came from national laboratories that had, had documented this potential. Next. And it's, it's also important to point out, uh, first, a, a 101 on how the grid works. You see a, a, a traditional power plant, green with stacks. Power is sent up onto high voltage transmission lines. As it approaches communities and cities, the voltage is dropped, distribution substations. You can see inside this red dash oval, a distribution substation, lower voltage, and then it goes to homes and businesses. Well, it's important to note that North Carolina is one of the leading states in the country in solar. It's almost all utility scale, rural or semi-rural, but relatively small projects. 95% of those projects were five megawatts or less, not much bigger than the array we just looked at uh, on the ground. Next. But that's not what Duke is now proposing. Uh, Duke is now saying, hey, we pulled the solar installers. They all wanna put uh, projects out in remote areas of North Carolina and what we call the, in South Carolina, the red zones, they don't have much transmission. So we're gonna have to build a lot of transmission to uh, accommodate putting these projects on the, the cheaper real estate in the state. Next. So what does it look like when you do lots of megawatts of solar? This is a glimpse of that. Uh, when you not do three or four or five megawatts, it's a 30, 40, 50, or as Duke is now proposing 200 or 300 megawatts, where you're covering the countryside with uh, individual projects. Just as a kind of frame of reference, 75 megawatt project covers about a square mile, which would be about, you know, urban downtown Raleigh, North Carolina. These are, these are massive projects. That's the, the vision is not you know, small is beautiful, but bigger is better. And uh, the NC Warren approach is keep it small, do it on a, a, a large scale, no transmission, minimal to no impacts on rural communities and a rural environment. Next. The Duke Carbon Plan also uh, it does include, as was mentioned, a continued use of coal plants. In this case, this is the Bellows Creek 2200 megawatt coal plant that uh, Duke is projecting they'll keep operating on coal until 2035. Next. And I'd mentioned that there's a big build out of gas turbines proposed. This photo is the Duke's most recent, Duke Energy's most recent combustion turbine, peaking turbine came on side, out, online outside of Charlotte. Uh, Lincoln 17 and their proposal is, well, we're, we're gonna keep doing this, building these units and a lot of them, but uh, you know, have faith in us that at some point green hydrogen, uh, it's almost like build it and the green hydrogen will come. We don't know where it'll come from or how much it'll cost, but uh, we'll use it and it'll all be good from 2050 on. Next. And just to point out, Okay, you'd think if we're going to keep doing coal, we do it because coal is cheaper. If we're going to keep doing gas, we do gas because it's cheaper. Not the case. What this table is looking at is one of the biggest energy conglomerates in the nation. Uh, uh, 
information they're putting to their shareholders where they're pointing out that first line, solar with four hours of battery storage, meaning a combination solar and battery storage project is the least cost uh, power generation source to meet uh, what they would call reliability needs, a reliable source of power. As you look farther down, existing natural gas, a little more expensive, existing nuclear, a little more expensive, existing coal, quite a bit more expensive, new natural gas, even more expensive. And so Duke is not continuing to burn coal because it's cheaper and it's not burning gas because it's cheaper. It's a, you know, it's a corporate justification, not cost. Next. So to, to summarize, uh, Duke Energy's carbon plan continues burning coal until 2035, relies heavily on new gas turbines and new nuclear uh, post-2035, you know, experimental nuclear and actually puts the brakes uh, on solar installations for numerous years. The solar will be in large arrays, larger than North Carolina has ever seen in, in square miles per project in, in rural North and South Carolina. And um, to get this solar to load to urban areas in North Carolina will require a major and costly transmission build out with very little contribution uh, perceived by uh, Duke or planned by Duke for rooftop uh, solar, distributed solar. NC Warren's distributed generation counter proposal, it leads with urban rooftop parking lot and, and ground infill, brown fields near these urban uh, areas. Those, those sites, uh, individual sites less than five megawatts, but collectively thousands and thousands of megawatts of solar, uh, no new gas, no new nuclear. Uh, a number of these coal plants are dual fuel now. They can burn gas or coal. And this plan assumes that they transition to gas now and then quickly transition to oblivion as the solar and batteries uh, pick up that load. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bill, so much. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. We have a good crowd tonight. Um, uh, I think, uh, Daniel, if you want to put um, all of us speakers up on the screen, um, I'm going to take the liberty of answering one question first, because it was something I wanted to say in my remarks and um, decided I didn't have time. But Bob was asking, um, what uh, elements of the Inflation Reduction Act can affect all of this? And um, I've been digging into that a little bit and um, uh, Bill and Tina can chime in after if uh, they want to add something, but um, it's going to affect it in a big way. As a matter of fact, in our, um, what they call a post-hearing brief that we just filed on Monday with the commission to any additional comments we have, our final comments before the commission goes off to make its decisions. We had a section on exactly um, what, what the impact or making the point that the impacts are gonna be huge. The, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act provided $391 million, uh, billion, dollars, sorry, yeah, billion in um, funding for clean energy. And uh, it, a lot of the funding is tax credits that people can take advantage of. Duke can take advantage of the tax credits. There are uh, a 30% base tax credit for solar and storage and wind, but it's they have other uh, credits that are stackable. If you do solar in a low income area, you get an extra 10%. If you do solar on one of those brownfield areas that Bill was just talking about, you get an, an extra 10%. So a large percentage of a solar project could end up being covered by tax credits. Um, another good thing is that nonprofit organizations can now take the tax credit. They could never take it before, but now they can take it as a direct payout. So churches, municipalities have uh, solar for them just got at least 30% cheaper, if not more. And then there's a lot of money also for rebates for energy efficiency. Uh, measures like if, if you're low income, you can get up to 100 of up to 100% rebate for certain things like high efficiency heat pumps. 
and a lot of other things. So there's going to be a lot of money going into the clean energy, onto the clean energy side of the scale that um, I'm having a hard time seeing how gas is going to compete with all of that. But one of our challenges is to get a good decision out of the commission so that we have time to figure out all of the implications of the Inflation Reduction Act. So we've got some other good questions too. Um, Bill and Tina, did you want to add anything on that topic? The, the only, only comment I would add on that is that the, there does seem to be a, a break for commercial solar between one smaller than one megawatt and larger than one megawatt with potentially excellent tax credits for smaller than one megawatt, which would fit very well with the NC Warren distributed generation counter proposal. Okay. And above one megawatt, what what do the what happens? Uh, still that? studying it, but the tax benefits aren't as great for above one megawatt. And okay. so it it would seem to at at first look provide special incentives for projects in this one megawatt and less scale range that would be kind of a sweet spot for the NC Warren distributed generation proposal. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was also a question. Um, I think Mac asked this. Um, what I mentioned that we're going to be reviewing the carbon plan every two years. What happens between now and the and when we review it again in 2024? What decisions will be made by the commission and specifically, um, what uh, what is what is Duke asking in this carbon plan to have done that will uh, grease the skids for its gas or nuclear? Um, are there things that we need to tell the commission to not do in this version of the carbon plan to make sure that we block those bad things before we have a chance to look at it again? I don't know if one of you wants to take that or... Well, I think there are a couple of gas turbine projects potentially in the pipeline. And then there's, I think uh, Duke Energy is seeking kind of development money for the nukes, uh, nuclear projects. And so I think uh, there it's stopping those initial efforts based on this first round. Yeah, there's um, something that they call their near-term action plan where right. they're asking asking for new gas, they the commission would not be approving the new gas if they say yes to that, but they would be signaling to Duke that they think it's okay for Duke to go ahead and and plan for new gas or nukes or the hydrogen. And then come Duke would have to come back later and actually ask for a license to do the new gas. But if the commission puts it into uh, this carbon plan, uh, that would make it more likely that the license would be granted. So uh, one of the things we can ask the commission for when we make comments is to just keep new gas out of, out of the near-term action plan. Um, could you say a little bit more, uh, Bill, about the financing, what kind of financing we need to, to reach these equity goals of making solar more affordable to low-income people? Yes, um, there are a couple of states, especially Hawaii, that's out in front of this. But the the so regardless of credit history or ownership background, people pay their electric bills because they like having the lights on. And so it's known in the finance industry that that the an electric bill is is excellent collateral for investment. And so, uh, especially in Hawaii, what they've done is they don't bill the customer, they just bill the meter. The, the meter is, they determine, uh, an example of uh, working or an arrangement for a renter or someone with no credit, if they paid their electric bill 12 months running, then they're eligible to have solar and storage uh, that is paid for with their electric bill. Let's say that electric bill averaged $300 a month. Then in that scheme, that meter is uh, whatever the solar and storage cost is, it has to be less than 300 a month because a customer isn't going to pay more than they've historically paid their bill. But that bill, that payment, instead of going to just pay for grid power, is actually going to pay off a solar and storage system. And 
it is billed to the meter so that if someone moves, they just pick up that that um, that invoice. But you know the credit history of the individual isn't a factor in it. And so that's just an example uh, of a financing scheme that opens up the opportunity for just about everybody uh, to have these you know, this distributed assets, solar and storage. And by the way, Duke has given lip service to this. And, oh yeah, we love that tariff on bill financing program. That sounds really good, but uh, I haven't seen too much headway. And when I say loves it, has has stated that they're supportive of it, but I, I'm not aware of any advances on that track yet. Yeah, I think not for uh, solar, but they are working on something for energy efficiency upgrades. It might be just a low income program. Um, um, Lois just noted that um, we didn't mention that nuclear has much lower carbon emissions. Yes, it does. <laughs> And we're not saying to close uh, the existing nuclear plants anytime soon. We're just saying that the, the small modular reactors that Duke is uh, proposing are very speculative, may never happen, and, but they want to get permission to pursue that at this point. So we're saying it's not new, new nuclear is not needed. Just uh, a couple of comments on that, Sally, is that that's a true statement about nuclear in terms of having a, a small carbon footprint, but that isn't addressing the fantastic cost of building new nukes and the, the waste issues associated with them. And so uh, Duke has not really put a price tag on the pursuit of the, these, uh, converting these research nuclear units into you know, full-scale commercial units. And the same issue is with green hydrogen. The projections on the cost of green hydrogen are spectacularly high. And so it sounds great if you talk about it potentially in, in the abstract, but you could uh, do the same job at a fraction of the cost with existing off the shelf of battery storage. And so the, there, there's, no, there's no justification for doing it when you have a cheaper, better, faster alternative. At hand. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions that I might um, pair. Um, one is about electricity demand increasing for EVs. We do want to promote electric vehicles, and electricity demand is going to increase because of that. And how does that, uh, how do you handle that? And the related question uh, was um, we. We, can, we know that we can do the whole system with renewables paired with storage, but it could be a lot of storage because we had a question from someone who has solar and storage at home and an EV and, and their solar and storage is not always enough to keep up with their demand. So we know that we have to sort of overbuild um, the storage to replace the gas that we don't want to see and how can you talk a little bit about the feasibility of that? So you got the additional EV demand coming on and then getting rid of the gas and the coal. How, how do we still meet the demand? So the question really is, we have this ever rising demand. How do we meet it if we're retiring these conventional plants and we're doing it with solar and storage? And this is not meant to be a, 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 a flip answer but the answer would be more solar and storage is that if you need uh, a dozen panels on your roof to meet your annual electric load you put and you need another uh, six or eight to handle your EV load you put 20 on your house and you you cover those loads that way and um, EV adopters uh, generally are also PV adopters meaning that there's a close match between people adding EVs and uh, solar adoption. And so simple answer is you add more panels uh, at home so you can cover that load where that EV is generally charged and you're not putting additional load on the grid. But I'd like to make another comment on this too on the upside is when there are millions of EVs on the road, that means there are tens of millions of kilowatt hours in those EVs uh, that can be used for other purposes, vehicle to grid. And so, uh, the, 
the mother load of reliability in 20 years may be being able to tap into those EVs as they sit and uh, use that for a backbone reliability. So it, it's not just a draw on the grid. It can also be a huge source of uh, reliability for the grid. Um, and and um, I think the question might have been about so system wide is the same true. We just if we're the whole system is reliant on solar and storage. We just build enough storage uh, to do the and enough solar to do the job. And is that um, economically feasible? And either under the Duke plan with the big solar and the transmission, or with our distributed plan. Well, it's definitely economically feasible. I mean, we just looked at, uh, again, the market here is a little bigger in California, but we're putting in 2000 megawatts a year on, on rooftops and parking lots. Many of those installations have battery storage and um, the and we're doing it without building out transmission. So we don't have that transmission cost for at least that addition of power. And so I'll just make my case again, we're, we're building out um, where we use it we're unloading the grid, we're not building transmission. The building in a distributed manner more than offsets economically the high cost of that transmission. Okay. Um, we are, you guys are burning up the chat. This is great. I don't wanna miss anything. Um, we are at almost at seven o'clock. So we said we would go for an hour. Um, we can stay on for about another 15 minutes if anybody wants to. Um, but I may just go ahead and say goodbye to anybody that needs to leave now and, and then we can continue taking some more questions. This has been really great and thanks for all your interest in this. All righty, let me see what else we got here. Um, Bill, someone asked, you, you mentioned that the, I think it was the, 200 megawatt that took up an acre or a, a square mile. Yes. Uh, could you say, someone asked about the 2.7 megawatt, the smaller ground mounted system you showed, what kind of acreage is that? About 15 acres. Okay. Okay. Compared to, and in acres, in acres, the larger one is, what's the square? Oh, it's 75 megawatts in, in the neighborhood of, that there are 640 acres to a square mile. And so it, it's in the range of uh, a square mile, 75 um, megawatt array, which is the kind of the base case template that Duke Energy used in the carbon plan for its solar projects going forward. Okay. Um, Amy asked, what, what about people in townhomes or apartments who can't put solar on their roof? How can they share in this system-wide approach and benefit from it? That's a great question. Another, another area of distributed generation that I didn't talk about at all, but is important is community solar arrays. Uh, say you need 10 kilowatts on your roof to cover your electric load and a car, EV, and that, but you live under in a shaded area, you live in an apartment or a complex, that the uh, another area of distributed generation growth is community arrays where the array might have 100 200 kilowatts and 10 or 20 different customers have a part of that array and that is absolutely necessary because uh, especially in the east where there is a lot of both uh, in the east for the for the tree cover but also for the situation you mentioned apartments condominiums where the roof space isn't there to do it uh, completely Okay, um, a couple of questions about wind. Um, uh, do you think it's worthwhile to push for offshore wind? Duke doesn't plan to do all that much and even the alternative plan, the Synapse plan that was submitted doesn't seem all that enthusiastic. And also, could you talk about um, transmission, the transmission that's needed for offshore wind? Yeah, I have to be full disclosure. I'm not a big fan of offshore wind. Uh, and I say that primarily from a cost standpoint is that Duke has estimated correctly a very high cost uh, for getting transmission out to offshore wind. And um, 
that, and we talked about it earlier with green hydrogen, nuclear, all of this is feasible, but if you're gonna spend all in three times as much for an offshore wind farm, if you include the transmission compared to a distributed solar and storage array, uh, I'm not one of those people they say it's all good that you know all of the above. If something is a better mousetrap, you know, solar and storage would need no environmental outside of the materials of construction and the lithium and those other elements go into it. And in terms of you know taking up huge areas of land and if you've got a solution that's got a, a low footprint and is is uh, cheaper and demonstrated. I wouldn't then switch gears and put billions of dollars into an approach that's going to be much more costly. And so that's really my bias there is not so much that it isn't doable, just why would you spend all the money doing that when you can get three times the, the green power uh, going a different road? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, Anne asks, uh, she says, you get the impression that the driver for the red zone solar is the interconnection queue and irritation about um, the interconnection queue, how long it takes for solar to get uh, actually turned on. Is that the case? And what would have to happen for those large scale projects not to dominate? Well, the you're correct that, uh, you know, the interconnection queue you know, for those folks that don't know what that is about, is developers are out there you know, throwing their hat in the ring to build more solar capacity. And they go out often into the red zone where land is cheap. They line up, say, a 500 acre farm where they could put in 75 megawatts of, of solar, but then they have to get that uh, authority from Duke or authorization from Duke that Duke to say, hey, we have room on the transmission system for you to do this so that you generate that power, it can flow to Charlotte or Raleigh. But if we, we run our model and we show that we can't put that power on our lines without overloading them, you're gonna have to wait until we get those transmission lines built to take that power. And so that queue can be used as, as, a, as a way to demonstrate, at least with this approach, we've got to build more transmission in order to uh, make this happen. But that's actually the argument we're using to say that we should do this from a distributed standpoint, because if we do it where we use it, homes, businesses, infill, infill uh, ground mounts, we're going to be on the low voltage system, distribution system, as most, almost all of your uh, projects to date have been done, they don't load up the transmission system. So there is no transmission queue block to solar if we do it at the distribute, distributed level. So that's, that's really a primary argument of ours. Okay. Um, Bob was asking, can, um, are there better battery technologies either today or on the near horizon uh, better than the Tesla Powerwall? Well, uh, interesting question <laughs> because um, the answer is, I mean, there are a couple of main categories of batteries, lithium, which Tesla is one, flow batteries are another commercially available battery that uh, use a very different chemistry, but are generally for, for larger installations. And then there's a whole host of, uh, you know, every, every little while you hear about the next uh, great battery technology. But I would say, I know out here we've got operational lithium and uh, flow batteries, but lithium's a whole world unto itself. In fact, Tesla is moving away from their uh, initial battery, which was a so-called nickel manganese cobalt battery to a more uh, an iron-based lithium uh, iron phosphate battery. So even in the world of lithium and even in the world of Tesla, they're changing their battery chemistries and how they go about this. And so, but to keep this not too long, the off the shelf ready to go or the lithium you know, and all of their sub variants and the, and the flow batteries. And um, I would say this, that even that is good enough for us to go full bore on this. We don't need to wait for some new uh, silver bullet battery to run the table on this approach. Okay. Uh 
Emmy uh, was asking if we could say something about Solarize the Triangle. Emmy, if you have the link for it and you could put it in the chat, that would be super because that's a good thing for people to know about. Um, as some of you know, NC Warren did some Solarize programs a few years ago and um, raised a lot of um, interest in solar and got solar on 200 rooftops. And there's a, pro a program now with, uh, that's being put on by the local governments in the Triangle area uh, to do the same thing. They've got a group, bu group buying approach. Uh, you can sign up by the end of the year to, um, oh, thank you. Um, there's the link in the chat. Um, so if you haven't got solar already and you think your roof might be appropriate, I would really recommend uh, signing up for a, uh, an evaluation. Our, our good friends at Yes Solar Solutions got the won the bid to be the installer for the program. So they're great to work with and they'll give you a free evaluation. You'll learn a ton about solar and who knows, you might even be able to, uh, to sign a contract and get solar installed. Now's the time. Um, we, one thing we haven't, um, somebody said give a shout out about uh, the value of energy efficiency and shrinking the pie. Maybe you could say a little more about that, Bill, some of the ideas you have in Clean Path for energy efficiency and demand side management uh, programs that could help with this. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that. And I'd also like to point out that Duke, uh, at least uh, narratively, said that that was the first uh, major step that they're taking in the carbon plan. And that's actually where they've been under a lot of uh, a pushback that they recognized how important energy efficiency and uh, demand response, how important they are, but had relatively little uh, in the plan. And uh, NC Clean Path looked at uh, not only the fact that as new generations of, of energy using devices, like for example, washer dryer, water heater, uh, space heating uh, are coming out more, more efficient. Uh, devices of this type are coming out all the time and looked at regulatory requirements with, for example, where you replace an a inefficient space heating system with a very efficient space he heating system. And if there's any delta in the cost, that that is uh, subsidized, that's an incentive payment. In fact, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is really focused on this, that uh, you're gonna get big incentives to replace a gas-fired water heater with an electric water heater, it is to incentivize it so that it doesn't cost the consumer more to do it. And you can make big gains in, in the reduction of demand doing that. And so that's a, definitely a focus of, of Clean Path. It's definitely a focus of the federal government now. It hasn't been a focus in Duke's carbon plan. Okay. Um, yes, in uh, during the uh, hearings for the carbon plan, uh, Duke had proposed one that it could reduce its uh, retail load by one percent. That was its big ambitious uh, energy efficiency goal, and a bunch of the other interveners said it should be at least one point five. It sounds like a small percentage, but um, but there was a consistent argument that Duke could do much better than what it's proposing to do. And yeah, if the Inflation Reduction Act funding comes through and everybody gets their uh, high efficiency appliances, it might happen without Duke even having to try. Um, okay, well, I know that I have probably missed a bunch of excellent questions in the chat, but we're I think I got the, the high points. Oh, what's Anne saying? <laughs> okay, that's, that's more technical than I um, understand, but um, in our report, uh, you talked about synchronous condensers, Bill. You wanna take that? Um, is that about? Sure. That? Okay. Sure, what, one of the arguments for building big centralized power stations, gas turbines, nuclear plants is 
that these big power stations kind of lead the dance in terms of the grid where these huge spinning uh, electric generators have so much mass that they hold the frequency exactly where it should be. And you have to have those devices in the system. And this issue about the synchronous condenser is that's a, a, a turbine generator to nu nuclear plant. You've got them. You can still let them do that work on the grid by you can shut the nuclear plant down and just let that um, uh, generator spin. And um, then it continues to lead the dance, but there's no nuclear plant behind it. It's just that component of the plant that continues to work. And I will say that public staff thought that was an intriguing idea, but then they spent some time uh, questioning it. But it is not uncommon to do that, to, to convert a, a, a generator that's existing uh, in order to maintain grid stability. So one of the commissioners thought it was a really good idea too, but couldn't get any corroboration from the engineers he was questioning. So I'm just wondering, and he tried to get information about cost comparisons and stuff. And, you know, obviously compared to a new plant, the cost is probably pretty reasonable. <laughs> you know? But um, I, I'm just wondering how, if it would be possible to get them more information because he was trying to get more information and didn't get it. Yes, I mean, there's, uh, I've got access to plenty of information on conversions to using power plants as synchronous condensers uh, and I'd be happy to provide that. If it's too late for you to send it in, I of course volunteer even though I don't have the expertise, but if you need a way to transmit it, I don't know whether you do or don't. I don't either, but I, I'll get the documents. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, let's. That sounds great. Let's talk about that off, um, offline because uh, it's a good segue to wrapping up, which is all of our official intervener comments have been filed. So that part of the carbon plan docket is over with. So we can't file that information that Anne's suggesting um, as NC Warren. But y'all still have an opportunity until the end of the year to submit comments to the commission. And you can do that on our website. It's uh, ncwarren.org slash carbon hyphen plan. Um, and we don't, who knows how carefully the commission looks at all of those public comments, but it's really important for the public to weigh in. And uh, if nothing else, the number of comments that are received should indicate something to them. So please do do that if you haven't already, or even if you have and you learned something more from this webinar that you want to say to the commission, go ahead and do it. And yeah, maybe we can get Anne to submit the <laughs> synchronous condenser information. That would be great. Or in two years when we have the redo of the plan. So thank you all so much. This has been so great. And I love all the participation. I'll go through the chat and if there's some questions we didn't get to, we can um, send that out in an email afterwards and we will send the link to the recording too. So thank you, Tina, so much. Thank you, Bill. It's been a uh, great spend in the evening with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you all.